Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Samantha Santa Cook. I'm the Fulbright Program Coordinator at Creighton University. I'm so happy that you all are here. <laughs> you are muted right now, um, but we'll unmute you for the Q and A. Um, we just thought, like, just to make things go a little bit smoother, um, make sure there's not some background noise and that you can hear Ashley. So she'll unmute you um, a little bit later. And then if you see, if it seems like there's gonna be a lag, if anybody's finding their internet is slowing down, you can mute your video. But if you wanna have your video on for right now and then there's no trouble, I think that's okay too. Um, so, yes, Ashley is, uh, she got her bachelor's from North Carolina State University. And she right now is a PhD student in the Ticton lab at the botany department at the University of Hawaii at Manawa. And uh, her research focuses on the importance of agroforests to the health and resilience of local people and plant communities in Fiji. And so Fiji is actually where she did her Fulbright study. Um, she studied abroad there as a, an undergraduate student and then as a PhD student applied for and got a grant to study there um, during her graduate work. So she worked with land, or she works with landowners now and governments and NGOs and academic institutions to understand the links between human and environmental health and what we can do to preserve or sorry improve resilience to increasingly severe global changes. So um, thank you so much, Ashley, for being here. And uh, why don't you take it away? Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to hopefully my video is the one that you all see primarily right now. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to uh, share with you all the Fulbright program and my experiences with it. I am going to now share uh, my screen and bring us to the PowerPoint. Okay. So hopefully you can all, oops, let's start from the beginning. Yep, we've got it. Okay, great. Okay, so I just wanna give you guys a, a, just a brief uh, introduction to who I am as an individual so you know who's talking at you today. Um, so like uh, Sam said, my name is Ashley McGuigan. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in botany. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree from North Carolina State University. However, before that, um, I'm actually born and raised in Minnesota. So I've done a little bit of moving around. Um, but when I was at North Carolina State University, uh, I was actually a pre-vet uh, student. And I, in my first year, I kind of realized that maybe that wasn't for me. I was really interested in plants and ecology. Uh, so I switched my, my degree focus. And during that time, I also realized I wanted to study abroad. And so um, I found uh, the University of the South Pacific in Fiji, and I studied there for a year between my sophomore and junior years. And that really informed and motivated my uh, current PhD research project. And so once I finished my degree, I, came, I uh, applied for the graduate program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And in the first year of my PhD program, I applied for the Fulbright uh, Fellowship and received a 10 month research award. So um, as we talked about in the introduction, my research really focuses on linked human and environmental health. I look at this specifically um, through agroforestry. And if you're not familiar with what agroforestry is, it is a tr traditional way of farming, particularly in the tropics, but especially in the South Pacific where people work with the environment as opposed to against it to grow their food. And it's important for, I look at it in terms of how does it uh, help people be resilient to things like cyclone disturbances, um, how does it contribute to diet and nutrition, and what kind of ecological services does it provide um, to the environment. Uh, I do this using uh, interdisciplinary uh, research methods, and we work in 10 different villages across three different islands in Fiji. The first year of my uh, research was funded by this Fulbright program, and I was able to partner with the Wildlife Conservation Society in Fiji and also different government ministries to create this team uh, of, of myself and two research assistants who helped me complete the, pro or complete the first year of the project. 
Uh, as a part of this, we co-developed and distributed a children's book on traditional knowledge uh, designed to help generate um, or facilitate intergenerational dialogue about traditional knowledge. This was identified as a need uh, from prior research from people in my lab, in the Ticton lab, um, where elders said that you know, they had trouble uh, passing down this knowledge because of different societal factors. So this is who I am. And oops. now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Fulbright program. So the primary goal of the Fulbright program is to increase mutual understanding between the people of the US and people of other countries. And this is really core. This is what this is the um, something you want to think about. Keep in mind as you as you're thinking about applying to the Fulbright program. Uh, it was created in 1946 by U.S. Congress, and it is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. In the U.S., it is the student program is administered by IIE, the Institute for International Education, and overseas, it's administered by commissions and U.S. embassies, and this is country-specific. Diversity and inclusion. Um, so this uh, Fulbright really strives to reflect the diversity of U.S. society. And so diversity uh, is really in every sense of the word. This includes uh, institutional diversity, fields of study, uh, personal, personal diversity. Like I said, Fulbright really wants to uh, be able to represent the full depth and breadth of diversity in the United States. And um, with inclusion, opportunities are open to everyone. There is no exclusion uh, with the Fulbright program. So eligibility. Uh, eligibility can get a little bit confusing, but basically, if you are a graduating senior right now, uh, you are eligible. If you have recently graduated, you are eligible. If you are a graduate student, you are eligible. And if you are a early career professional, uh, and this especially pertains to creative and performing artists, you are eligible. Um, you have to be a US citizen by the application deadline, and you have to have bachelor's degree or equivalent by the start of the grant. Um, and you cannot have a doctorate by the time of, at that time of the application. Uh, there are some country specific requirements, and these are really important to keep in mind. So I wanna go over the, um, how this looks on the website with you. So I'm going to switch to the Fulbright website. So I'm, just, I'm going to be navigating back and forth between the presentation and the website to help, if you haven't looked through the website yet, uh, help get you a little bit familiar with it. So basic eligibility is gonna be found under about eligibility, and then eligibility requirements. So this goes over in really great detail. Um, what makes you eligible, uh, preferred qualifications, et cetera. And then of course, also what makes you ineligible. So really take a look at these um, guidelines. However, what's really important is looking at country specific guidelines. So to find that, you're gonna go to country and then um, the, it's divided up into different regions. So I'm going to go to East Asia Pacific. And just as an example, we're going to use South Korea. So first of all, we'll go over this in the next slides, but you can see there's a diversity of awards even offered for this one country, but we're focusing more here on study slash research awards. So here you'll be able to take a look at the country profile and get an idea for um, uh, what makes what candidate profile might look like, but specifically looking at things like foreign language proficiency. Uh, do you need to have a certain uh, uh, level of language understanding and fluency to be able to apply for this grant? Um, so really take a look at, uh, again, also what makes you ineligible. Uh, these are all going to be very, very country specific. Um, not even, doesn't even necessarily across the board be the same. Let's see. Okay. So as I touched upon just there, there's two different kinds of uh, primary, two different kinds of uh, US student program awards types. There is the study slash research grant, and then there is the English teaching assistantship. Now I was not an ETA, 
uh, but I have some friends who were, and my understanding is, is this is a little bit more of a structured program. Um, the embassies or commissions uh, help to identify and pair you with uh, uh, an educational institution who um, need uh, teaching assistantships. There's more awards in this category, but there are less countries that you can apply to. Uh, but your main uh, uh, purpose is going to be to help teach English and US culture in the classroom. The study research grant, which is the one that I uh, was awarded, is, a, is more about independent research and study. Um, some, some countries are more hands-on in helping you figure this out, and some of them are much more hands-off, so it's, it's variable. Um, there are less wards, but more countries that you can apply to for this. And this is also where your arts projects uh, fall under. So the application components, I'm gonna spend uh, a considerable amount of time on this because I know people have typically questions about this. So uh, the very first piece is the basic personal data and program information, uh, which includes the abstract host country engagement and future plans. So flipping back over to our website, Um, you're going to want to go to applicants and then application components. And since we're focusing on the study slash research awards, this is where I'm going to focus. Uh, biographical data is pretty straightforward. I'm not gonna go into that too much. However, we wanna look at program information. So um, these are sometimes uh, looked over, however, they really shouldn't be. Um, especially the abstract host country engagement statement and plans upon returning to the US. As you can see, you don't have a huge character limit when discussing these things. So it's going to be very important that you are able to communicate succinctly and effectively uh, in the abstract, for example, the uh, goals of your research project. Um, the uh, and this means again that you also want to have a really well polished statement of grant purpose. Um, the host country engagement statement is also really key. Um, as it says here, at its core, the Fulbright program aims to promote mutual understanding, and so you really want to be able to communicate how are you going to forward those goals of mutual understanding between people of the U.S. and people of the host country. How are you going to be a good cultural ambassador? Uh, while living in the host country, you want to be really specific about these ideas. Um, and then plans upon returning to the US. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what your career and educational plans are, tie in how this Fulbright experience is going to forward those things. Um, and again, you don't have a ton of space to do this in. So um, it's really important that you revise, write and revise, uh, and uh, just as much as you would really on the, on the essays. And then, so getting into the essays, um, the statement of grant purpose. So if you are applying for a research or study grant, you get two pages to do this in. If you are applying as an ETA applicant, you get one page. Regardless, you both get uh, a one page personal statement. So with the, um, with the statement of grant purpose, um, if you have, uh, you really wanna consult the country specific requirements to get a good idea about what kinds of projects they might be especially keen to support. And in fact, I'm just going to flip over really quickly to the South Korea page to show you where you might get an idea about that. Um, if you look at the candidate profile right here, it starts to talk a little bit about um, applicants whose research pr projects illustrate uh, specific knowledge of Korean and or East Asian history, politics, culture, or religions, for example, will have a better grasp of research possibilities. So trying to you know, uh, look at these country specific pages to kind of get an idea for types of research um, uh, and, the, and again, the candidate profile that they're looking for uh, for these countries. And then once you get a, 
idea of that in terms of structure, um, Fulbright really presents you with a great uh, tool for, I mean, they bullet point exactly what needs to be in this statement of grant. So if you've ever written a, uh, uh, a research proposal before, looking through this, you'll be able to, to basically see that they're asking for all the typical components of a, of a research proposal. If you haven't written a research proposal before, that's okay. Because again, this is a really great resource actually for outlining exactly how do you write a research proposal. Um, you only get two pages to do this in. You can tell here, you can see here that there's a lot of information that they want you to cover. Uh, so it's really critical that you start early on this and you revise often. Um, I think I probably had at least 10, 15, maybe even more different um, um, revisions to my original um, grant purpose. So I was you know, constantly working on this, this, this proposal. Um, and it doesn't have to be a huge task. I mean, it doesn't, shouldn't be overwhelming, but it, it should be something that you schedule time in to do. Um, and then at the same time, uh, you want to make sure that you're really addressing a couple quick key, key questions, which they highlight up here, which is the, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of what you're proposing. Um, really making sure that you identify all of these different um, um, topics or questions. Um, and then related to that, which is sometimes overlooked, is the feasibility. You know, you can have a really great research proposal, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't seem feasible, uh, it's not fundable. So you really have to demonstrate that you've done the research on the country and that you know what the potential hiccups might be, um, what additional resources you might need to um, obtain to be able to carry out your research. Um, you know, looking at how the culture and the politics of the, ho of the host country might impact your, your research proposal. So essentially just showing that, you know, this, this project is feasible. And if it's not immediately apparent, how are you going to make sure that it is, um, that you can execute it, either through your personal skills or through um, uh, resources that you might be able to collaborate with, um, with uh, institutions in country to help you carry this thing out. So, for example, for me, um, my language proficiency was 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 good conversationally, but I am not able to um, communicate in the Fijian language in depth. And so, having those, uh, being able to identify uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society and uh, working with people there as research assistants to be able to make sure that I could carry out my work would have been an example of making sure that the project is feasible. Um, and then for your personal statement, this is really an opportunity to talk about uh, who you are as an individual. What is your story? Um, you know, what has, what's your, what's your personal history, your family background? What has influenced your intellectual development? What kinds of cultural experiences do you have or not have? And how does that inform, uh, you know, where you are today? Um, it shouldn't really be just like a list of things you can find on a CV. Um, it should really highlight, uh, you know, your biography, your narrative. Um, you know, what is your what? What have you done? What is your history? Uh, how has that brought you to where you are today? And what do you want to see moving forward? And how does the Fulbright um, how does the Fulbright really help you achieve those things? And how do you help Fulbright achieve uh, its goals of mutual understanding between the US and people of, uh, of the host country? Um, let's see. And I'm going to share. So um, reports and references. So uh, the foreign language evaluation, um, going back to this. So for some countries, again, this is all, it's always country specific. I know I'm repeating that often, but it's, it's true. Um, 
some countries require you to have uh, different levels of proficiency in the host language. Some require none. Um, that's dependent upon the language of the host country or, for example, if the host country teaches, you know, the official language is English, um, um, that might make it different as well. Uh, but if a foreign language form is required, there are two different forms you have to fill out. There is the uh, personal um, the language self-eval, and then there is the foreign language evaluation form, which is filled out by uh, preferably a, a university level uh, professional language teacher. Um, so as it self-explanatory, um, language self-evaluation, you fill out this evaluation form and, and uh, assess your own um, uh, proficiency in the host language. And then the foreign language evaluation form, like I said, it's, it's, it's preferably filled out by a professional language teacher. However, uh, for less commonly taught languages, as it says down here, uh, if you can't find a professional language teacher to be able to uh, assess this, um, you can ask a college educated native speaker of the language uh, to, to help you or to fill this out for you or to assess your language skills. Um, for me, I was not required to submit a uh, language eval. Fijian, the Fijian language is not a requirement for the um, South Pacific or the Fijian program. However, I did. Um, I, do, I did have some, some coursework in Fijian language. Um, and I've also uh, 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 studied it on my own. And these are all really good things to be able to uh, communicate with the, with the Fulbright program that you've, um, you know, it might, not be, it might not be a requirement, but it's definitely going to help your application if you have some experience in the language and uh, you demonstrate it through these, um, through these forms. And then um, the next component was the recommendation letters. So the recommendation letters, you need three recommendation letters. Um, and this is not a character reference. This is really somebody who can speak to three different things. Um, uh, you, your, uh, the research, your statement, your, your grant, your, your research proposal, um, you as an individual, and the relevance to um, these things at, at, with the host country. Mm -hmm. um, you want, they want to be able to, like I said, speak to, the, to your ability to carry out the proposed project. Um, so these people really need to have, uh, you really need to have a well-polished statement of grant purpose um, by, uh, by the time that you submit that you ask for a recommendation letter from me, from whoever this is going to be. Uh, you also want to have your personal statement also pretty well polished. Um, you should give your recommendation letter writers three to four weeks to complete these letters. Um, and so think in, with thinking about that, again, you want to make sure that you are starting early and revising often on these two essays to be able to submit to them a really well uh, polished um, uh, grant proposal and personal essay. Um, and then the website goes over really well the different, um, the, the procedure for submitting these things. Um, transcripts. So the next component are, are the transcripts. And for this, you want to make sure that um, you are submitting any and all transcripts um, from institutes of higher education that you have attended, whether or not you received a degree from these places. So um, this is going to include your undergraduate transcripts. Uh, for me, it included my study abroad transcript at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. Um, if, uh, if you have attended graduate school, um, I also had to submit the first, I think it was first two semesters of, uh, or first semester of graduate degree um, coursework. And if you don't submit any of these things, your application is not complete. So 
They don't have to be uh, official transcripts. They can be unofficial. So if you have to pay for official transcripts, you don't have to worry about that. And you can submit the unofficial ones, uh, but they have to be, uh, but you have to make sure you collect any and all transcripts and submit them. And then the final component, oops. The final component was the, uh, the, the, the other, the research slash study affiliation letters. Um, so, oops. yeah, so, okay. um, so what is that? This is, this is, this was a big question for me actually when I applied, um, and it's a little bit confusing at first, I think, but essentially, um, this is the letter that you need from an individual or an institution in the host country. And it's basically saying that they support your research, they support you as an individual, and um, uh, these are the things that they can help support you with. Um, um, this is country specific in terms of who can supply this affiliation letter. So again, make sure that you're reviewing the country specific page. Some places uh, it can be a university, um, other places it can be a, an NGO or a government entity, um, but there's a whole you know, host of different types of affiliations you can have or that don't qualify. Um, so how do you find somebody to uh, write an affiliation letter for you? There's a lot of different ways you can do it. I had the advantage of having already studied in Fiji and so I had a lot of uh, connections at the university there um, but if you don't have that you can talk with faculty on campus who maybe do research in that part of the world you can talk with uh, reach out to uh, international students on campus that you might be in contact with um, there is a directory um, that you can access through Fulbright uh, another um, Really, I think advantageous way to do this is while you're writing your research proposal, take a look at who's who the authors are that you're citing and see if you can reach out to those authors and um, maybe they'll be willing to um, you know, have a, an affiliation with you. And that's a really great way as well, because then the people who you're studying, citing are also then helping guide your research. Um, and then because it's not it's not a true recommend it's not a recommendation letter although it can speak to you know the feasibility of the project or it should essentially because that's what it's helping demonstrate um, uh, the this this page outlines exactly what needs to be in that affiliation letter um, and what uh, you can you can you can direct the person who's going to be writing your affiliation letter to this web page, or sometimes people who are writing these will ask you to kind of give an outline about what needs to be in this affiliation letter, then you can send it back to them and you guys can work on it together to revise it. Um, but it's essentially uh, needs to show how that they do support you, that the research is relevant, and that you can carry it out, and that these are the, the resources that they can provide to help you do that. So for example, my letter included um, that I would be given office space at the University of the South Pacific. I was given access to a shared vehicle so that I could drive around uh, at least the main island um, to access my different uh, village sites. Um, and then also advisor support um, from uh, my affiliate at the University of the South Pacific. Uh, and then, and then for the arts supplementary materials, um, I'm not super familiar with this, but uh, my understanding is that this includes things like you know, portfolio, things that would be in a in a, in a, uh, a portfolio, creative arts portfolio. So award benefits. So pre-grant and in-country, uh, Fulbright will provide you a round-trip airfare um a monthly stipend and again this is country specific so uh this stipend is going to be different from from country to country and it's it's not it's you know you're not going to be living in luxury but you're not going to be living uh, terribly either it kind of liken it to a graduate student salary um 
it's it's enough. Um, uh, accident and sickness benefits. So Fulbright will uh, go will work with you to kind of um, uh, understand the whole health insurance realm. Um, and then other possible benefits include support for dependents, uh, research allowance, tuition, language lessons, enhancement activities, and disability related accommodations. Um, I had a, a, a small research allowance, um, which I was able to uh, augment with additional smaller grants. Um, so uh, but these are all country specific, so not all places offer these things. And then post grant, you get access to the Fulbright network of alumni. This is kind of neat because then if uh, if there if other alumni are uh, logged into this or, or um, hooked into this network, you can see where the other alumni are around you and who they are and if they provide contact information, how to contact them. Um, the State Department's alumni website, uh, you are also then eligible for 12 months of non-competitive eligibility hiring status from the federal government. So what does this mean? Um, this essentially means that you have for a year after returning from um, your Fulbright um, year, uh, if you want to work for the federal government, when applying, you have uh, three different key advantages. There's less competition when applying, faster application process, and hiring managers typically have a strong interest in hiring you. Um, so what happens if you come back and you're not interested, you're not uh, in the market for, for a job yet? Maybe you're uh, going, down, going on for further study, graduate studies, or maybe you're serving in the military. This, this non-competitive eligibility uh, can be extended for up to two years. However, this is at the discretion of the hiring official. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. It's a, it's a nice perk. Then you get a lifetime Fulbright email address. Um, this, is, this is kind of a fun thing. Um, and then the Fulbright Association as well. So again, just going over factors of selection, uh, as I talked about really, quality is key, but feasibility is also equally as important. Um, you really want to make sure that you uh, uh, revise your, your essays to highlight these two things. Uh, academic or professional record. You don't have to have a 4.0. I didn't have a 4.0 uh, because Fulbright is great in that it really evaluates you as a whole individual. Um, but obviously having a good academic or professional record is important. Personal qualifications, why, why you are a good candidate personally for this project, for this position. Um, language preparation if necessary. Uh, certain factors uh, as established by the Foreign Fulbright Scholarship Board. Um, the extent to which the candidate and the project will help to advance the Fulbright program goals. So again, increasing this mutual understanding between the US and people of the host country. Um, requirements of the program in the individual countries, so the country specific criteria, again, be reviewing that and understanding it. And then the desirability of achieving diversity um, through your project. So the um, application timeline, design the project and prepare the application starting now. Uh, I know it seems like you have a lot of time, but you don't want to be doing this in a rushed manner or being stressed about it because you want to be able to um, revise these essays with your mentors and um, mentors often need a little bit of extra time to be able to go through these things. Um, the national application deadline is October 13th and then there is a extensive review process for these so it takes a little bit of time for them to get back to you about um, your proposal um, so from November to December, there's the U.S. review, and then uh, if, you, if it passes that, then it gets sent on to the host country for the host country to review um, your application as well. And then final selections are from March to June. So I'm going to hand it over. Let me make sure. 
hand it over here. It should be, you're not muted, are you? Nope. Okay. Good. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley. So, um, yeah, Ashley has given this really great overview. What you're seeing right now on your screen is just our Creighton page. So if you click on the tab that um, asks you to, um, like if you wanna search for a, an FPA, a Fulbright Program Advisor, which is what I am, and you search for Creighton University, I'm the one who's gonna come up there. And so this is my email address and where I am located on campus, and then a little bit about you know, who I am. And so I'll just say a little bit more about our process here. So I kind of wanted to highlight a couple of things. First is that we have a reason to celebrate. So we'll be sending a Creighton graduate to Mexico this year. Um, she got awarded a Fulbright. We're still waiting to hear from a couple other applications. So we're not releasing the news publicly until we know um, how many we have going on Fulbrights. But that's one thing that we're really excited about. Um, second, just about the timeline. So if you're a junior right now or a senior right now, you can apply. So if you're graduating this semester, um, you're eligible. And if you are going to be graduating next May, so May 2021, and you're a junior right now, but you'll be a senior in the fall, then that's great, right? You think you want to do a Fulbright in the fall of 2021? Super, then you can apply now. If you're a first or second year student, then let's talk and sort of be thinking about this for your junior year or your senior year. And I'm happy to work with you there. And I'm excited that you're on this call already, sort of like getting some information and expressing some interest. So um, really excited to work with you on that. Uh, so Ashley didn't talk as much about the ETA, the English Teaching Assistant position. She didn't have one of those, but that's a, such a good option. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things. So if you're looking for a more structured kind of grant, this is a really good option. Um, and also if you were intimidated by this idea of getting a letter of affiliation from another university, the ETA grant does not require that. And so that's a really nice opportunity just in case um, you don't have a research proposal in mind already. Um, there's also one other grant that you can get, which is um, a grant to pursue a master's degree in another country. And so, like Ashley's been saying all along, that's country specific. And so that's the same thing that's going on with this one as well. So um, keep those things in mind. Uh, next, I would like to, um, I would just wanna work with all of you. I'm really excited. You should know that the Creighton deadline is two weeks ahead of the Fulbright deadline. So it says October 3rd, 13th there on the website. And I just wanna make sure that we can review it and have a complete application and that I have time to go through everybody's in real um, detail. And so I want you to have a complete application by October, what, 2nd, I guess in this case. So, um, and then if there's any sort of last minute things, I wanna be sure that we can fix those and we've got like a little bit of a window of time to do that before you actually submit it. Um, and then finally, I thought I would just tell you that I've also been through this process. So I had a Fulbright to Japan in 2019 and um, I almost didn't apply because I saw a lot of barriers for myself. So for one, I study rhetoric. <laughs> I'm in the communication studies department here on campus. And I study rhetoric, which is not a field that a lot of people really understand. And so I have to do a lot of explaining and sometimes I think that can be challenging. Second, I don't speak Japanese. And so um, I was really worried that this was going to prevent me from getting awarded a grant. Um, my, the application said that I needed to speak Japanese well enough to accomplish my project, which I did because I was at an English speaking institution. And so I didn't need any Japanese there. Uh, and then the third barrier that I saw was that I was going to a non-academic institution and really wasn't even sure that I would be allowed to do that. Um, I'd never heard of anybody doing that before, but um, I did and I could. So I was really happy about that. And I learned through an FPA training in March that these things that I saw as barriers were actually things that helped me stand out and helped my application seem attractive because it made my application kind of unique. And so, um, yeah, they were actually advantages in the end. So even if you're worried that maybe you don't fit or um, you're not sure, like something in this talk is making you feel like, oh, I'm so scared to apply. Um, 
I would still love to just talk to you about options. So um, yeah, so let's meet up and talk about that. All right, back to you, Ashley. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that um, um, I think that last point that you made about these those things that felt like barriers um, uh, was was really help, like you said, help you stand out. And I think that really speaks to that diversity aspect of Fulbright really means diversity in every sense of of the word. So this was to in your case, it was it was affiliational diversity. Um, yeah, that that's a that was a, that's a that's a great point to make. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to actually um, open it up for questions and things like that in a second. But these are just uh, some of the ways to stay connected. Um, if you have um, there's webinars available at the Fulbright website. Uh, you can email the folks at IIE directly. Um, take a look through the Fulbright US Student Program website. There's videos on YouTube and Vimeo. Uh, Vimeo. Um, and then the social media handles. And then of course down here is my, um, per, uh, my email address with Fulbright. It's really long. Um, so uh, I, can, I can ask if Sam wants to send it out via email or just go ahead and, and, and note it down now. Also, but, just then we're recording this presentation and so you can always come back and visit this page too <laughs> right exactly that's a good point <laughs> so let's see here i am going to i think stop the share um did we want to do q q a via yeah. the chat box oh sure or you can unmute and okay <laughs> Whatever you want to do, actually. All right, so I've unmuted all of you. So if you're not talking, go ahead and try and um, please mute your microphone. Um, but does anybody have uh, any questions um, of any sort? I'm, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Uh, either feel free to jump, just jump in, or if you want to, or if you want to type it out, either way, it doesn't matter. I have a question. Um, how did the Fulbright program impact your PhD program and your experience in earning your degree or finishing your degree right now? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think um, so it, it funded the first year of my field study. So I neglected to mention I work in Fiji for about four to six months every year. And I've done that for the past three years. Um, so uh, I would really wouldn't have been able to fund my PhD uh, the first year of my PhD without this. And then it's also been really great, I think, in helping me get um, other awards because you know once you get a Fulbright, it's really uh, it really demonstrates that um, you can carry out um, you know pretty uh, pretty cool projects or you know uh, that you're independent and that you can, you know, be an ETA or that you can, you know, do grad school in another country or do a research project in another country. So it really helps uh, uh, lend to, um, you know, other applications. So, for example, after my Fulbright, um, I came back and I got, I don't know if you're, if any of you are familiar with the Foreign Language and Area Studies Scholarship. Um, it might be relevant to some of you guys if you, I think as undergraduates, you can actually get this as well, but um, that funded the next year of my graduate degree. And then after that, I got the um, National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. Um, and I really do think that Fulbright was key in being able to cite those for more other applications. And then it's also informed, I think my, um, my career goals, you know, I was very academic focused prior, and now I'm more interested in um, in the State Department. And um, you know, as I kind of understand what the role of the State Department is um, through the ECA, the Educational and Cultural Affairs, um, you know, I've become more interested in seeing how I can apply the things that I've learned through all of these experiences at the federal level. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Yeah, who else has questions? What other questions do you have? Hi, I have a question. I'm oh. Allie. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, my question is, does it make sense to wait if you, if you might do um, 
a master's program where maybe you could get more experience. So if say you might wanted to do an, um, a data science or um, some sort of master's program where you'd probably have a better application after mm -hmm. um, your, like, or during where you learn um, maybe more about research methods in general. Um, would it make more sense to wait or is it kind of better to try to just like shoot your shot when like earlier on? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I, I think just, you know, go ahead and apply because uh, the great thing about Fulbright is you can apply as many times as you want. There's no limit um, unless you achieve a doctorate, obviously. Um, there's also an advantage to um, applying with uh, well, I, I mean, if you were if you were affiliated with a master's program, you would still be with an institution and you have access to those resources in terms of having a, an FPA who can help you navigate the um, the whole application process. But I really think it's worth it just to go ahead and, and apply, because even if you don't get it, you've done it now and you can revise that application then um, during your master's or after your master's. Um, I don't know. Is there anything? Sam, maybe to add to that that you could think of? Hmm. Um, yeah, I would say it depends on what your goals are. And so if you're trying to do a research project, it might make sense to wait until you have maybe more connections or some more experience, you've honed your interests down somewhat. Um, but I think plenty of people don't wait. <laughs> so there's that um, there's that component of it as well yeah. Um, yeah. i think if you're thinking about getting a graduate degree in another country obviously don't get a master's here first so if you want to go for that type of award then go for it now you know before you go to a different program right. um, and then if you want an eta i know that you can apply for that even after you have a master's um or like um like Ashley said, if you are in a PhD program, you can apply for that. Once you have a PhD, you would have to apply as a professional. So that's the one that I did because I applied as a faculty member here. But um, that's just a different category of award. So anyway, yes, it depends, I would say, on what your goals are and then what kind of program you want to apply to. Yeah, and there's also, um, yeah, like, like you just touched on, there's actually a whole host of other different types of Fulbright awards that you can get. Uh, there's the Fulbright Haze, which um, you can also get as a, I believe it's just PhD students, but it's to help uh, in dissertation writing in the host country. So um, there's a lot of different opportunities. This, If you're eligible for this one, I would just recommend going for it and then you can uh, apply for the other ones in other, you know, in other places where you're eligible. We've got about five more minutes. Um, if anybody else has some questions. I'm Does anybody else have questions before we go? These are great questions. Hi, I have a question. Sure. Um, so the timeline for when you hear back about the Fulbright grant is like very long and also very late, especially if you're applying to other programs. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way to know like typically when the country you're applying to like responds back? Like is there an average like way to look at that or? There are a lot of, um, that's a good question because mine I didn't I don't think I heard back till May May it was really late for me um, but there's a, I mean you can kind of gauge and it's Fulbright this isn't a, you know this isn't an official Fulbright um, website or anything like that but you can just do searches online there's actually a lot of uh, unofficial Fulbright communities where people will uh, put into like a Google spreadsheet when they applied and when they heard back um about their grant and it actually goes back like a couple like numbers of years um so uh, you can uh, kind of gauge it that way you could reach out see if there's anybody um that you can identify online who's gone to that country recently and just reach out to them and ask them when they heard back um but yeah there's not really uh an official message from fulbright on that unfortunately so also, um, you saw in that timeline that Ashley posted that they do a U.S. review and then a country, like an in-country review. So if you don't make it past the first one, that U.S. review, you'll know in, um, I think, November or December. So they'll email you that. Yeah. Um, and then that, that January to May, that's when the in-country review starts. 
and it like Ashley said it really depends on the country so with mine Japan I knew in January and they were like really fast um, and then I had a friend who applied the same year to go to Uganda and he didn't hear I think until like maybe April or May and he left in June so he had to rent his house and like get his kids enrolled in school there and like find people to walk his dog or I don't know what all but it was it was like a ton of planning right at the end <laughs> that was kind of stressful for him but yeah so um it depends on the country but you'll know if you pass the first round in November or December yeah I guess as a follow-up question to that then like because if you're thinking of applying to like multiple things, like not just Fulbright, but like maybe grad school or like another post-grad opportunity, is there a way to like defer full, like if you get a Fulbright and you've already chosen something else? Or? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that happened to me. So I actually had applied for the foreign language and area studies uh, fellowship the same time I applied for and, and was accepted um, same time I got Fulbright. You cannot, you cannot defer the Fulbright, unfortunately. Um, could not, you can, and you can't, you can't, uh, can't defer the, the foreign language one either. You can defer something like the National Science um, Foundation's uh, Graduate Research Fellowship. So um, it's, you know, it, 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 it just depends on the other fellowships that you're applying for, if they allow for deferment. Um, sometimes if it's like a university's fellowship, they will want you to go ahead and take the Fulbright anyways. And so they might work out a uh, plan with you at an individual level, um, but Fulbright, you cannot defer. Yeah, and I've even heard, so um, if you're applying to graduate school, I've heard of the programs that are notorious for not allowing deferments. Um, and that, so if a student calls or emails and says, hey, can I defer? They're like, nope, that's our policy. But if you say, hey, can I actually have a phone call with you and I have a Fulbright and here's what's going on, or if I call them and say, look, the student has a Fulbright and I think that really only looks good for your program. Right. Lots of programs actually will make a deferment under those circumstances. And so, um, yes, I think they don't do deferments, but I think that because it's such a prestigious award, a lot of other things are willing to kind of defer for that. Yeah, exactly. And I, on their program later. Right. Yeah. And I was able to work out um, um, tuition uh, waivers with my university to be able to take on this Fulbright. So universities really typically do really want to work with you to be able to to allow you to take this Fulbright, because like Sam said, this is a pretty it's a prestigious award and it only looks good for that university. Um, unfortunately, uh, we ran out of we've run out of time, but um, this is recorded, so I will save it, and uh, you guys will all have access to it. And um, and uh, yeah, feel free to email me. Uh, I'm really happy to to help you with any questions you have. And I have your email addresses because you registered, and so I'll probably send a follow up email at least with this the link to the video, and then just offering to kind of chat with you more if you're interested in applying this year, or if you want to kind of think ahead for later too. So thanks all for coming. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for Ashley. Can we just do like a silent sort of <laughs> applause for thank her? You all thank you very much. much. It was Yeah, a this was great. Really super. Um, all right. So uh, see you all later. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.